That was an old-time spark transmitter you were listening to. Let us go back and recall the early years. Radio, or wireless as it was first known, began at the turn of the century. Both amateur and commercial stations were, of course, crude with very limited range. In these early days, the amateur did more listening than transmitting. The first practical receiver used a coherer. This odd device was popular until about 1906, at which time the electrolytic and crystal detectors took over. A coherer was centered around a small glass tube filled with metal filings. An incoming radio signal would make the filings stick together or cohere which would lower the resistance and actuate a magnet. Until 1920, most all radio work was done on low frequency or long wavelength. The antennas were huge. This one is nearly a mile long. The stations used a tremendous amount of power even for local transmissions. One of the most popular was the famous naval station NAA at Arlington, Virginia, with its powerful spark transmitter. Many an early amateur learned the code by listening to it. distress signals from the sinking Titanic made many aware of the value of wireless. amateurs prior to the Titanic disaster. However, the increasing interest made it necessary to have some form of licensing. This took place in 1912 and the first call book was issued in 1913 listing over 1200 amateur stations. There were however thousands who were not licensed as you will soon see. One of the most popular suppliers of radio equipment was Hugo Gernsback Electro Importing Company. Most early amateurs either made or assembled their own equipment. The more fortunate could buy an EI receiver. All amateur operation was around 200 meters until after the war. Now let me introduce Clarence Tuska pioneer amateur and co-founder of the ARRL, who will tell us about the equipment used in these early days. In 1908, when I first became interested, a cousin who had previously installed a station of his own in New York City decided that I should have one when I lived in Nyack. So he made a single slide tuning coil, an EI electrolytic detector and a spark coil for the transmitter. 
This is a typical 1912 receiver, a three-slide tuner and crystal detector. Note the single earphone. A recent interview with Clarence Tuska told me much about the pre-licensing days. The, these early days, I used no call letter. The government did not regulate amateur wireless at that time, and there was no need for a call letter. The range of the transmitter was about a mile and a half in the town of Nyack. Later, when I moved to Hartford, about 1909, I adopted the call letter SNT. SN stood for Southern New England, T for Tuska, and other people in the vicinity of Hartford used the same system. A complete station was a relatively simple affair. The spark coil transmitter is at left and receiver at right. Uh, Clarence, would you uh, tell us about your meeting Hiram Percy Maxim, the man with whom you share the honor of founding the ARRL? When I was about 14 years old, I learned that Mr. Maxim was interested in getting into amateur radio. I became acquainted with him and built his first amateur radio station, which consists of a loose coupler, a variable condenser, a crystal detector. The transmitter consists of a spark coil, uh, some condensers, and a helix. Let us go back to those early days and actually listen to a QSO between two unlicensed amateurs, each using their initials as call letters. the young amateur making a transmission. Adjusting the cat's whisker on the crystal detector, we listen to the reply. <laughs> 